Well, good evening, good evening. God bless you on this Tuesday evening. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise God for all his goodness, his mercy, his faith, his faithfulness to us, his forgiveness. And we just celebrate God today on this Tuesday afternoon or evening in Defiance, Ohio. And so we celebrate this awesome weather that we've been having and we praise God for it. We celebrate it today and we just thank God for what he's doing weather-wise this hot in April. And I hope and pray that you are enjoying your day also, your warm, sunny day here in Ohio or in Michigan or Indiana in the, in the Midwest area, probably Illinois also. And so I just thank God for you uh, allowing us to be in your living room or on your job or in your place, workplace, or in your car, wherever you are viewing us live stream, we appreciate you. And so God bless you. And if you're on today, just let us know you're on. And I can't see your face, but you can see my face. And I just want to just say good evening, Pastor, or Hello, Pastor, something like that. Let us know that you're viewing live stream. And then you can welcome other people who are also viewing live stream, too, right now on this Tuesday evening. And so I hope that you get something together to uh, take notes with. Uh, we are uh, want to give some nuggets today, some information today <clears throat> to you to be a blessing to you and also challenge you at the same time. Uh, what God is doing right now in Galilee. And God is doing awesome things and amazing things in Galilee as we continue to pray and seek God's face and seek God's favor as we in this process of revitalization, spiritual renewal and revival. And I know that someone can testify to somebody today on Facebook that you are being blessed by this awakened prayer series, that you being blessed by this 21 days of praying and fasting, and that you can testify that God is breaking down some strongholds in your life. I know he's breaking down strongholds in my life, and also he's just answering prayer too. I, I mean the power of corporate prayer when the church come together, pray together, pray on a core, praying for the same thing. God is awesome. And I'm praying again, I'm asking you, I'm asking you again, I'm asking you again that you be in prayer with me as we are praying for salvation. We're praying that souls come to Christ. We're praying daily for our grown children, sons and daughters, and grandchildren, granddaughters, grandsons, and great-grands. We are praying for our husbands and our wives. And our relatives, we're praying for our families to come to know Jesus Christ, to have an authentic relationship with him. That's what we're praying for. So please, I'm asking you, please join in with us at Galilee as we are praying for family members to come to Christ, our loved ones. We have a rich harvest just in our family. And we have a rich harvest, of course, in our community and we know that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are what? Are few. And so we counting on you. Jesus is counting on you to be a laborer in the vineyard. Can he count on you? Can he count on you to be a laborer? I don't. And he's counting on me to be a laborer in the vineyard because there's so many unsaved and unchurched people in our community. And right now, Christianity is in decline in America and for the first time in history, church membership is below 50% in America. So it's a rich harvest out there. And that means a lot of people need to hear the gospel and a lot of people need to see the gospel lived out in our lives. Amen, somebody. Amen. We, they need to see it in us. They need to see Jesus in us. And so let's start with prayer this evening. Get down to the lesson here. Lord, we just thank you and honor you today. We're praying, Lord, for you to have your way in this study today. We're praying, Holy Spirit, touch us right now to, mm, to avail ourselves, to surrender ourselves, to open ourselves up to receive your word this evening. We need to hear from you, Holy Spirit. Teach us this evening. Speak to us right now in the name of Jesus. 
quicken us in our spirit. Convict us of anything that we need to change, we, we need to repent of. Forgive us for any sins that we have done or committed in your sight, God. You said if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, we need you right now to cleanse us. Mm. Purify us, Lord. Let our heart be right, Jesus, before you. We don't want unrepented sins, unconfessed sins in us. We thank you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you this evening. If you, if you have your Bible, we want to look at a uh, passage of Scripture here in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. If you have your Bible, we we'll look at John chapter 14 in your Bible. And look at number <clears throat> verse 15. <clears throat> John chapter uh, 14 verse 15. The title of this um, lesson here, uh, uh, because we're on this prayer series, uh, in this prayer mode right now, being revitalized, taking a detour from the I Am series to deal with a couple of things the Holy Spirit has revealed to me doing this, praying and fasting. And um, then we go back to the I Am, who God says I am. So I must share a couple of things that he has revealed to us to help us be spiritually renewed, John chapter 14, verse 15. And so it says here, if you love me, keep my commands. Very simple, not real deep here. Another version of the Bible, New American Standard says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Amplified version says, If you really love me, you will keep and obey my commands. Wow. And and so as I begin this, talk about and discuss this topic today on love, this will be part one of this because you won't be able to finish it up today. So this will be part one. I'm I'm reminded what I saw in the basketball tournament for college, the NCAA men's basketball tournament. And I saw a game played between Gonzaga and UCLA. And one of the best basketball games I've ever watched at a collegiate level in my life. Even the commentaries, Barkley and others, said it was just a, a, a classic. You couldn't play any better. Neither team lost that game, but one had to lose by three points and technically be declared the winner, but they played to the best of their ability. And UCLA was an underdog in this, in this match up, 11 seed. They played in the first four games and made it to the final four. Isn't that awesome from the first four to the final four? And they didn't have the first four um, games like – in the past, they wouldn't even been in the tournament. But this tournament, who was an underdog, who supposed to have been knocked out in the first round by Michigan State, ended up advancing all the way to the Final Four. And they played the best game they could play, coached by the best coach to be coached at this time in history. I and mean, he coached them up as an underdog to win that game, put them in position to win that game. Game goes into overtime. It's just awesome. And they did everything that the coach told them to do. They did everything that the coach instructed them to do. And I believe that's the same thing that Jesus is looking for us, that he's looking for us to do everything that the Holy Spirit tells us to do. Jesus, I bet, is looking for us to do everything that he has commanded us to do. And that's why he puts this in the Bible, because being a disciple of Christ is not just a religious activity. It's just not something you do once a week on Sundays. Amen, somebody. Anybody? Does that make sense, anybody? It's not just something you do twice a week, once on Wednesday Bible study or Tuesday Bible study, and then on Sunday 
worship. Living a believer is more than just attending Bible study, attending worship service, attending Sunday school, giving money in the church, volunteering at the church. It's much more than this doing a religious activity. Amen, somebody. It's about living a life as a disciple of Christ. It's about what Jesus says in this passage. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And in part two, we're going to look at some of the commands that Jesus lays out for us to obey. Being a disciple of Christ is about being an imitator of Christ, number one. And it's about loving God so much that you obey and do what God instructs you to do. You do what Jesus commands you to do. You do what Jesus tells you to do. You do what Holy Spirit tells you to do. You are obedient because you love God. Does that make sense to anybody here? You show your love for God by being obedient to him by fulfilling his will for your life and for your ministry and for your local church and for your ministry assignment. And you do it not out of a religious obligation. We got to break this religious spirit. It's not out of a religious obligation. It's out of love. I'm obedient to Christ because I love him. Does anybody feel it, feel that today? This type of thing, you feel it. I'm obedient to Christ because I'm in love with Jesus. Anybody here in love with Jesus t- this evening? I'm obedient to him because I love him. And I do it out of my love for him. Not out of compulsion. Not out of a, reli- a religious obligation. Because listen here, so many people do things out of religious obligation. Well, I'm a part of the choir. So because I'm a part of the choir, I I have to tithe. I have to be at Bible study. That's the wrong reason to tithe, and that's the wrong reason to be at Bible study. You ought to be there. You ought to be at Bible study because you love Jesus and you want to learn more about him. You ought to tithe and give your offerings because you love God and you realize he has blessed you financially and you ought to sow that seed into the kingdom of God and do it not grudgingly, but cheerfully. How many cheerful givers do I have here today? On oh, this type of view, a cheerful giver today. We, we do it because we love God. I, love, I can't beat God giving no matter how hard I try. I cannot sow enough seed into the kingdom of God. If I gave 100% of my paycheck, it still wouldn't be enough. And when I consider it and compare it to the blessings that God has blessed my wife with, my children with, my six children with, my grandchildren with, and bless me with, and bless other people around me, I, is there's no way. I can, co- can pay God enough, give God enough, serve God enough because of his blessings. Anybody feel that here today? This type of thing, if you feel it here today, that there's just no way I could do that. And so we ought to do it because we love God. And that's what he says here in this text. He says in this, uh, in this scripture, and another scripture, if we want to look at it as a cross-reference scripture, John chapter 14, verse 21 says, whoever has my commandment and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by the father and I will love him and reveal myself to him. John 14, verse 23, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. John chapter 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and remain in his love. First John chapter four, chapter first John Chapter two, verse three, 
By this, we can be sure that we have come to know him if we keep his what? Commandments. First John chapter five, verse three. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Woo, hallelujah, praise God. And so one of the things I want to share with us as we look at this passage, examine this passage of scripture in 1 John chapter 14, verse 15, one thing we must understand, I think, it, I think there's some confusion here. And the confusion, I think, lies in the word love. If you love me, I think the confusion and the, the, the misinterpretation and the misapplication is on the word love. Not understanding the meaning of the word love. Does, it, does anybody understand that here today? Just feel me. I think that, because to be honest, that's the reason why you've had, come on, let's be honest today, if you're listening, right? Sister, brother, the reason why you had a lot of issues with relationships and a lot of relationships with other men or women have not worked out well for you. And the reason why you have problems is because of what? They don't know how to love you or you don't know how to love them. It's a love issue. Because if you love me, you respect me. If you love me, you'll be there for me. If you love me, you'll care for me. If you love me, you consider me and consider my needs, my wants, and not just yours. And so a lot, so maybe the, the problem is, just like in relationships, on how to love somebody, maybe we're confused on how to really love God. So it's two, two things I want to bring out about loving God. Okay, so you take your notes. There's two things here. One, two, right? I hope it don't go three. It might go three, but we do one. One is understanding the, the definition of love in this particular passage. That the definition of love here in this particular passage means, in the Greek meaning, um, agapo, not agape, agapo, uh, it means to prefer to love. It means embracing God's, loving God so much that you embrace his will for your life. Wow. Woo. Stop right there. Loving God so much that you embrace his will for your life. Wow. It's um, loving God so much. You do what he prefers, not what you prefer. Woo, hallelujah, praise God. Uh-oh, let me slow it down here. So loving God doesn't mean it's like Burger King, have it your way. Loving God means I do what he prefers, not what I prefer. It means his will over my will. That's why we get we, we get the scripture, we get the text, and we get the story, we get the illustration, and we can see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane struggling with that decision to go to Calvary. And he goes before God, it says three times, and he says, not my will, but thy will be done. I love you, God, so much that your will overrides my will, that your will is more important than my will, because I don't prefer really to go to Calvary and die for all these people, but your will is more important than my will. Uh-oh, watch it now. That means that I don't, listen here, that means that I'm going to give you this. That means that you don't prefer to forgive somebody that hurts you, that used and abused you, that mistreated you, but God's will overrides that because his will and his commandments that you forgive other people. Even though you don't want to do it, you do it because you love God because you realize his will is more important than your will. And you realize after you do his will, 
that his will is better than your will, that his ways are higher than your ways, as the Bible says, and his thoughts higher than yours. And then you realize that his will is was was what was what was best for you. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Mm. It, it, it's just like a parent. How many of y'all are parents out there? Just raise your hand. I'm sorry. We don't have people first. How many of you are parents out there and realize that there are things that you told your child that you advised them or told them or instructed them not to do. And you did it because you loved them and was looking out for their behalf. You had their best interests in mind. Even though they didn't like what you told them not to do, to go get high or to hang out late or to be in by the street light, right? They didn't like some of the restrictions you put on them, but you did it out of their best interest because you were trying to protect them. Does that make sense to anybody here today? Come on, type it in if it makes sense here. And so the same way with God, God does things and he tells us to do things. He commands us to do things, not to hurt us, not to take away our freedom, not to hold us back, not to hinder us. He's not like the devil. He's not kind to kill you or destroy you, right, or steal your blessings. He's trying to release blessings to you. And he's trying to protect you. So he puts in some commandments of things that you should not do and I should not do out of our own benefit. And when we really love God enough, we will realize that he's doing it for our benefit, for your benefit. These commandments that God gives us is for your benefit. The same way with an earthly coach. When a coach coaches a football player, he's trying to help the football player maximize his potential so he can possibly make it to the NFL draft. He's doing it for, his, for the athlete's benefit. When he coaches basketball, he's doing it for the athlete's benefit, trying to help him maximize his full potential. And if we can trust an earthly man, if you can trust a coach, a, a track coach, a football coach, a baseball coach, a soccer coach, a basketball coach, how much more should you trust God who is, who is omnipotent, who is omnipresent, omniscient? How much more should you trust God? God is not doing this to hinder you. He's doing this to help you, to bless you. And your family. And when we really love God and sold out to God, we really understand that it's about doing his will. And his will is what's best for me. Woo, hallelujah. His will is what's best for me. I, I do what Jesus prefers because I love him. That's what this Greek word here means. It means that I, I do his will because I love him. I do what he prefers. It's more important for me to please him than to please myself. Because we know, listen here, let's be honest today. Come on now. Come on. Come on with me. Because we know where pleasing self leads to. We, 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 you, you know where pleasing self led you to in a path of destruction. Pleasing self, getting high on drugs, pleasing self, drinking gin and juice, Hennessy, vodka, rum, pleasing self in orgies, pleasing self in fornication, pleasing self in adultery, pleasing self in lying, stealing, gossiping, backbiting, uh, fits of rage and anger and drunkenness. We know what pleasing self le leads to. That's why some of y'all got prison records and been arrested by the police. We know what prison self can lead to. It leads to destruction. But when you make a decision to please God whew, and to serve him, it leads us on the path of righteousness and it leads us to blessings. And not only blessings for me, but God is trying to listen here. The blessings roll from me to my family. For generations. 
Because I love God and do what he prefers. It's about loving God and doing what he prefers, what he prefers. And, and so another scripture that comes in mind as we look at this, you can write this down, uh, Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12, because we're talking about loving God here. Not loving self, loving others. We're talking about loving him. Because you love others out of your love for him. But that's another discussion. And so Mark chapter 12, verse 30 to 31, it says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, one, with all thy soul, two, with all thy mind, three, with all thy strength, four. This is the first commandment. So this is point number two. So we are to, God is saying, listen here, this is how I want you to love me. I want you to love me with your what? With your heart. Mm. And that heart here represents the seat of emotions, your heart. To have an emotional love for God. And that's why sometimes people get emotional when they're preaching God's word. Isn't that right, Elder Payne? When they're preaching God's word, we get emotional pastors, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about here. Get emotional when praying because get emotional when praising God because we get a, we, we doing it out of our what? We praise him out of our emotions. That's why it says make a joyful noise. A joyful is an emotion unto the Lord. So we love God emotionally. Then it talks about that we are to love God with our soul, our, our, who we are, our identity, our personality, right? Who we are as a person, our personhood. We have to love God with that. Mm, hallelujah. Our identity. Love him. Then we have to love God mentally in our mind, learning more about God, understanding more about God. Getting revelation from God. Love him mentally. I'm going through this kind of quickly here today. Because like my time. And then also to love him with our strength. That means love him physically. Right? With our physical strength and serving and doing our assignment. It takes physical strength and energy to, to serve him. To fulfill our assignments. To love him, God, with strength. Strength to do what God has called us to do and chosen to do and fashioned us to do. To love him with our strength. So basically, to sum it all up, he's saying if you, God wants you to love him with your total being. That's what he's trying to say. With all of you. That's why he says in Romans chapter 12, offer your bodies as a what? Living sacrifice. Living, not dead, living, not dead, living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. He wants all of you. I am God's property. And I'm proud to say I am God's property. I belong to God. Anybody here feel that today to me? Anybody here proud to say I belong to God? I'm not ashamed to say I love Jesus. I am a Jesus lover. God owns me. I belong to him. He owns everything. My clothes, my car, everything. He tells me, give away my car. I give it away. He tells me, give away money. I give it away. Right? Clothes, I give it away. Because I don't own anything. I'm God's property. I belong to him. And I love him so much that I'm willing to do what he tells me to do because I know he wants what's best for me and has my best interests at heart. And that's why I don't have a problem with obeying God's command because I've learned to love him out of what out of all of me, right? To offer myself as a what? Sacrifice unto him. God wants all of you, not some of you. And that's probably part of the problem, reason why people don't obey the commands of God, because they haven't fully surrendered their life to God. They haven't fully given themselves to God. The reason why they have problems tithing. The reason why they have a problem serving. The reason why they have problems forgiving. The reason why they have problems praying. The reason why they have problems praising. We will have problems coming to church and not forsaking the assembly of, right? The reason why I have problems with corporate worship, corporate prayer, right? S using their spiritual gifts and their natural talents for the Lord because they haven't completely surrendered their life to God. They're not totally 100% in love with God. 
You know how it, it's sad. The reason why I had to bring this up is sad. It's sad that I mean, so many people talk about how much they love Jesus, but their heart is far from God. Amen, somebody. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth and shame the devil. They say they love Jesus, but their heart is far from God. They're not obeying any of his commands. They say they love Jesus, but they won't do anything the Lord tells them to do. What type of love is that? I'm confused. Whatever type of love that is, I don't want it. You're confused. Because my Bible says, if you love me, Jesus said it. You knew you would do what I command. I do the things I do for God because I love him. And I do it. And my goal as I grow and mature in Christ is to do it without any hesitation or reservation. I do it out of love for him. Because I love him. And I'm just concerned about all this religious um, language, religious practices. Religious rituals, religious propaganda, all this religious stuff. And these people are saying this stuff and their heart is far from God. They say they love God, but they have sin. They won't turn it loose. They have unconfessed sin, unrepented sin that they will not give up. They say they love God, but they won't stop gossiping. They say they love God, but they won't stop murmuring and complaining. They say they love God, they won't stop backbiting. They say they love God, but they continue to rob God in tithes and offering. They say they love God, but they continue to do everything that is a sin against God, that displeases God. But he says, if you love me, then you're going to obey what I command you to do, because you love me. I'm concerned, I really am, concerned about us being such a religious nation and a religious culture. Maybe that's why two or three generations are not coming to church because they see the hypocrisy of the other generations. They see the hypocrisy of the silent generation, the hypocrisy of the baby boomers. They see it. Maybe that's why a lot of X's and millennials and Z's are not in church because they really see that you really don't love God. You're just a religious person doing a religious activity doing religious practices, but your heart is far from God. As soon as you leave church, you go cuss folk out. As soon as you leave church, you go get high on drugs. As soon as you leave church, you get drunk. But yes, oh, I love Jesus. Do you really love him? Then if you love him, then you will obey what he commands. You will give it up and turn it loose. Because God is, Jesus, listen here. Jesus is offering us a better life. He's offering us a better life. Do you understand that today? I'm, I'm trying to help us while we're in revitalization, while we're in spiritual renewal. Jesus is trying to offer you and me, a, he's trying to offer you a better life. That's what he's trying to do. And all you have to do is surrender and say, you know what, I want this better life. I'm going I'm to begin to make a step to obey Jesus more and more because I really do love him. And I want to show him that I love him by being obedient to his commands, by doing what Jesus tells me to do. Not just because the pastor told you to do it. You ought to do it because you love God. And you respect the pastor because Jesus put the pastor over the church. To shepherd the church. And that's why he says, obey them that have rule over you. You do it out of love for Jesus. And so let's pray today as we close out today. I hope you were helped today. I'm praying that you were helped. Pray you can share with somebody else and help somebody else. If, if you love Jesus, then start doing what Jesus tells you to do. Please. I'm asking you, please, to start doing what he tells you to do. Your life would be so much better. I see so many people having a hard time with life, can't keep a job, get fired from job to job to job, get kicked out of churches because they really will not surrender their life to Jesus. And it's sad. I'm, I, it, it grieves me to see so much pain that people, that's in people and the pain that they cause to other people because they really don't love God. 
They really don't love Jesus enough to surrender to him, to surrender all to him. They really don't love him enough. And I, I'm grieved. I really am. It's sad. Because these people have so much potential. Shirley Houston know what I'm talking about. Don't you? These people have so much potential inside of them. The spiritual gifts they have. It's sad that they won't be used the way it should be because of their own pride. The natural talents that they have. They could be such a blessing to the kingdom of God. But they just have, they refuse to change. They refuse to surrender to God and really love him. And they miss out on the blessed life they could really have. And then the church misses out on the blessing they could be receiving from them in the Christian community. And so let's pray. Lord, we just thank you and honor you today. We praise you right now, Lord. We praise you, Lord, right now. Honor you, Lord, today, God. We just surrender to you today, Lord. We just, we just need you right now, Father. Mm. My heart is grieved for those who are religious, mm. who really don't have an authentic relationship with Christ. Say they love God and go out and murder people. They say they love God, go out here and hurt people or harm people and oppress people and, and racist towards people. But they say they love God. How can you say you love God and you hurt so many people and mistreat people? And you won't surrender to Jesus. Your pride won't let you do what you're supposed to do in the kingdom of God. So, Lord, I'm praying, Lord, break down the pride in us, break down the strongholds in us that prevent us from fully being committed and surrendered to you to really show you the love that you want from us and that you deserve from us. Touch us right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. I'm praying for our families to be saved, our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I'm praying, God, that they heart. Mm. Oh, we respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the drawing of the Holy Spirit. Touch! Our sons and daughters right now and grandchildren, touch our husbands and wives that they come into that relationship with you. We pray for salvation today, God. We pray for the harvest in America, God, the harvest. Lord, we just thank you, Lord. We pray, Lord, you continue to cover and comfort the Willis family and Knox in St. Louis, Missouri, the loss of the transition of her father there. Touch them right now. Mm. Praying for Sister Pen's um, sister who's in the hospital, Lord. It's your will be done. That, mm, Lord God, touch right now. Mm. We're praying for those who are bound to coronavirus that they're for recovery right now. In the name of Jesus, touch Sister Paris' relatives right now. Mm. Oh, God, her brother. Mm. God, you're able to do anything, Lord. But most important, we're praying for people to have an authentic relationship with you. To really be absent from the body and be present with the Lord and not go to hell, but to go to heaven. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise God. And so I'm praying that you have a blessed, a blessed evening. I'm praying that you have a blessed evening. And remember, we're here for you to love on you and encourage you and pray for you. And so if you feel you need prayer this evening, give this number a call, 419-766-0547. If you need encouragement, call that number. If you have questions about having a relationship with Jesus Christ, just call that number. If you want to know more about our life groups here, or Bible study, or how to become a member of Galilee in Napoleon or Defiance, just call that number. You can join our church from anywhere in the United States of America. We're going to love on you and disciple you. And so just call that number if you need our help. You are not alone during this pandemic. You're not alone. We're here for you, sister. We're here for you, brother. You're not alone. And so God bless you and have a good evening and pray that you all is well with you and uh, continue to pray for us and pray for souls being saved. God bless you and have a good evening.